Welcome to the AP Systems uh, ECUC and EMA installation training. This is part two of our two-part series. We covered the, the QT2 installation primarily yesterday and touched briefly on our, our ECU setup and the, uh, the EMA. Uh, but this is when we do the deep dive into uh, both of those, both the gateway and our online portal. I'm Jason Higginson. I'm a Senior Director of Marketing with AP Systems. With me this morning, we have Derek Gertz, who's uh, Technical Support for North America, and Jared Chris, also on our Tech Support team for North America. Excited to be with you today. So quick housekeeping, we have a Q&A uh, and a chat box for any questions that you might have, and we'll address those questions at the end. We're also going to provide a copy of this uh, PowerPoint. We're going to put it up on YouTube. And we'll send everyone a link so that they can easily access that. So that way it minimizes the note taking during this webinar. So, and we're recording it for that purpose. Quick agenda. We're gonna do a recap of uh, what we had uh, covered yesterday, very briefly. Uh, we're gonna spend most of our time talking about uh, the ECUC, how to install that, some of the features in our EMA Manager app that allow you to set up a commission that ECUC, uh, and set up your, uh, your homeowner accounts, your uh, system owner accounts, and uh, complete that setup through the EMA Manager, and then how to do those, those final steps in the EMA. So as a quick recap, we have uh, two main microinverter types uh, the DS3 and the QT2 each come with a, a couple of models. These were specifically designed for today's high capacity PV modules. The DS3 uh, was, was launched in early 2022, and uh, the QT2 was launched at the uh, 2022 RE Plus show. Uh, they have uh, encrypted Zigbee wireless uh, for, for high speed data communication. They have higher reliability than their previous generations their California Rule 21 for use in that market. Uh, they have built-in rapid shutdown compliance. As you can see with the DS3, we have three primary models in 240 or 208 volt, uh, covering a wide array of uh, PV module sizes. Um, the plus at the end of those sizes, uh, that's to indicate that you can put a higher wattage PV module on these units. It's not going to negatively affect the inverter. You would simply have more clipping. So. If you have a 490 panel instead of a 480, you can still pair that with the DS3L, it'll be fine. Uh, for the QT2, we have the 208 volt and the 480 volt uh, with uh, uh, PV module pairings into the mid 500s. Our gateway, the ECUR and the ECUC. These are our communication hubs. They take all the data from the microinverters uh, from the power conversion that's uh, the power and the energy that's being produced by the microinverters. They send that data, uh, to, the microinverters send that data to these gateways, which then push it up to the cloud so that you can view it on your system, your EMA, uh, on, your, on your computer, or on your smartphone. Um, this also are capable of a direct connect to your phone via Wi-Fi so that you can set up those systems. And we'll get into detail on those today. The energy monitoring and analysis, this is our EMA, this is our online system, our portal where you can see all of that, um, that cumulative and consolidated uh, uh, energy production data. Uh, you can also break it out over time. You can also see history, you can see module level production and, uh, and quite a few other features. Our EMA manager app, this is what we'll be deep diving into today and how to use this app to your advantage. And, uh, and turn it into a tool uh, that you can use to, uh, to commission the system and set up your uh, customer account. And I'm gonna hand off to Jarrett to do a, uh, a quick overview of uh, both the ECUC and, uh, and how to uh, set that up for success. Thank you, Jason. So with the ECUC, it's going to be able to communicate to your inverters, collect real-time data, also does electricity data monitoring. Some of the better features are the zero export function, redundant energy control, and it's going to monitor consumption and production. So you can see what your, um, your site is using.
here's a picture of what the ECUC looks like. You can see where the CTs for the production is, the redundant energy control, the, con the consumption CTs, your power interface, and you can see the Wi-Fi antenna and Zigbee antenna are there on the right. There's a little reset button in the top right, say if you need to change the password for your Wi-Fi logging in. Normally the password is the number eight, eight times when you go to connect locally to the ECUC through the EMA Manager app. And these functions are only available with commercial application. They're not available on residential. So with the Zigbee communication, the maximum distance it can handle the signal would be 75 meters. And it's gonna communicate by Zigbee to the inverters. And that's with a direct line of sight. So say if there's anything in between, like a metal shed, metal roof, anything along those lines, you'll have to work around by extending that antenna to the other side of the metal to make sure the signal is not interrupted. And you can only have 100 inverters per ECU. So like I was saying, one of the main com common reasons there's any obstruction, it'll, it'll mainly be metal. Like say if you install it in a metal box outside um, or if there's a metal roof, like I was saying, you just want to get around that. You can add an extension antenna, an SMA with a male slash female connector, and any of them will work. And I would recommend not going more than 30 feet as far as your connector cord to extend those, as you can see in the photo there. And you'll want to keep it protected from the rain. So the CTs for the ECUC, they come in two forms. For the production, it's going to be an 80 amp. And for consumption, it's going to be a 200 amp CT. We're going to go over inst installation next. Take a moment to take a look at this diagram so you can see the, the layout of how you'd want to install. You can see the PV modules on the roof, the lines coming down to your AC junction box, and then how they would move around and go through the AC distribution box and the power. And you can hook those ECUCs up with LAN connection, like a, directly to the router or through Wi-Fi as well. But if it's going through Wi-Fi, I would recommend making sure there's no metal in between the router and the ECUC. We recommend a 30 foot maximum distance direct line of sight between the router and the ECUC. So that way the signal goes through smoothly and the data is transferred. And if, you, if it's okay, I was gonna jump in real quick. Um, this is Derek, by the way, speaking since I haven't introduced myself on this particular webinar. Um, I just kind of wanted to point out on this uh, chart here, it gives a good overview of how the communication process works between microinverters and ECU and then ECU um, being uploaded that information to our servers, which would then populate on that EMA, say, app or your desktop version of the EMA portal. Um, you can see, and a lot of times we get questions from, say, installers when they're on site, you know, say they sync up a microinverter and are waiting for um, that information to populate on the app or on the desktop version of the EMA portal, um, why there is, you know, say a five minute delay between um, real time data and what gets uploaded on the EMA portal is just because it has to go through this process here. Um, basically, the microinverters send the information over to uh, the, your ECU, the ECU then sending that information to our servers and then the servers then populate that information on the EMA portal or the app. I uh, just kind of wanted to point that out. That this is a good uh, chart just showing you how that communication flow works. Thank you, Derek. That hardline Ethernet cable uh, over Wi-Fi or, or cellular whenever possible, uh, just because primarily with, with Wi-Fi, um, it's something the end user controls uh, more than the solar installer. Uh, so, you know, when they change their, their password or their, their ISP, uh, it's, it's always good to have just a solid connection. So, um, yeah. Jared, take it away. Thank you. And once again, you're going to want to make sure your antennas are installed outside of your AC distribution box. Say when you install the ECUC directly in the box or your PVAC box. So your power interfacing wiring with your standard 
208 or 277Y or 480B, 60 hertz. You've got your line one, line two, line three, neutral and ground. And you can see that there on the AC input. And they are unavailable to residential split phase. So these are only gonna be available with commercial systems. So when you're installing your CTs for the ECUC, you're gonna to wanna to make sure your arrow is pointing the PV side or load side to ensure the proper function. Say you get it set up and you're looking at your metering. There's only one line, uh, a black line that should be showing a negative line and that's the consumption. The rest should all be positive. If any of the other lines on the diagram are showing negative, that means the CTs are hooked up backwards and you'll need to adjust them accordingly. So that way they're facing the PV side or the load side, that way they correctly monitor. And you're gonna need a total of six CTs, three for consumption, three for production. Once again, that's gonna be 80 amps on the production and 100 amps on the consumption. And as you can see here, you can just review the white and black cords, where they would go on those CTs, how you would put them in. White is gonna be your positive and black is gonna be negative. And you can see them there. They will be shown on the ECUC itself. So it'll be easy to connect those correctly. Once again, the CT orientation, you're gonna to wanna to have those, the arrow pointing the PV or load side. So it is going to, going to monitor your consumption. So you're going to see what's being used versus production. These are the lines I was speaking of. There's the black line. And the blue and the green should show positive. And negative is going to be uh, hooked up backwards if it's not like that on the consumption. The consumption can be negative, but the other should be positive all the time. This is how it'll actually look like on the view itself and how you'll be able to tell. You see your production, consumption, and usage. Once again, usage and production should be positive, consumption negative. If they're backwards, you know you need to turn them around, your CTs. Once again, just going over the internet connection, we definitely recommend, again, the ethernet cable as the best and safest way to go to avoid interruptions. However, it can be hooked up with Wi-Fi as well. And I would just recommend not having any metal in between the router and the ECUC. So if it's, just, it's, if it's installed in a distribution box that's metal, you'll wanna put those, those antennas on the outside to avoid interruption. You can set this up in your ECU configuration. Whenever you're setting up the system, you go through the app and you're able to walk through. You go to your workspace section once you connect to the ECU locally, and then you go to the WLAN tab. That's where you'll find your ECU network settings. And then you just click on the WLAN tab and, and the ECU will sense the homeowner or your customer's Wi-Fi, and then you enter their password so it can connect to Wi-Fi. You're setting it up that way. And you can do everything on site through your EMA Manager app. So if you log in and before you connect, the first thing you want to do is connect your device, your smartphone device, to the ECU's hotspot. And the password is going to be the number eight, eight times. And you can do that before logging in to your installer account on the EMA Manager app homepage just by clicking the local access tab. Or if you do log in, you can go to the workspace tab and the local access section will be on the top right of the screen.
this just goes over the same steps I just said. Once again, open the EMA Manager app, go to the workspace section for your EC configuration, and you can check the system check. We definitely recommend staying with Ethernet connection when possible. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in here. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is Derek. I was mentioned on the beginning of the call, and I know I jumped in there once, but just wanted to reintroduce myself here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take it uh, from Jared at this point, and we are going to dive into a little bit of the EMA Manager app. Um, if you don't have this downloaded currently yet, uh, there is an option right now for you to take your phone and scan that QR code um, and get that downloaded. Um, as Jared was mentioning, we do highly recommend it. We consider it to be our one-stop shop app, um, or I like to call it that at least. Um, you're able to do quite a bit of functions in there, whether it be commissioning systems, checking on customers' data from their site remotely, um, quite a few different things. So we're going to drill into that here um, on the last part of this webinar, uh, but just wanted to give you a moment if you haven't downloaded it yet that we do recommend, and you can uh, scan that QR code on the screen there if you would like, and that'll take you right to it. Um, if you don't want to scan the QR code, um, you could just go to the Google Play or Apple App Store. Uh, go to that search bar up top, um, just type in EMA Manager, um, and you'll see it sitting there uh, available for download. It doesn't cost any money. It's free, um, so it should be pretty easy to do. And going on to the, uh, to the next slide, <clears throat> we're going to dive into some of the components of how to use the EMA Manager app. Um, so this first part here, uh, we're going to show you how to commission a system using the EMA Manager app. And there is two ways to uh, do this. Um, on this picture here that you can see, um, if you were to download the EMA Manager app, right when you pull it up, it's going to have you either enter a username or password um, to access your installer account. Um, if you don't have an installer account, or let's say, for example, you have a technician that might be commissioning a system that doesn't have a username and password to get into your installer account, that is completely OK. Um, you can still access the system locally just by clicking on that ECU app button, you can kind of see on that arrow there um, on that picture right below the login button. Um, that'll give you local access um, to set up the ECU, scan microinverter IDs, basically do whatever you need to do. So you don't just kind of wanted to point out that you don't necessarily have to have a username and password to be able to commission a system. We do highly recommend it, but it's not necessarily required. And I also will say too, um, that we did have an update happen to our app. Um, so that ECU app button that that arrow is pointing to there, it actually says local access now, um, but figure same thing. Uh, the button's still there. It's just a little bit of a name change, but um, figure after you click that ECU app or local access button, that picture to the right where it shows connect ECU with that orange button there, that's what's going to show up for you. You're going to want to go ahead and click that connect ECU um, orange button. And then after pressing that, and we're going to go on to the next slide and it'll show you what it looks like after you press that button. Um, it'll take you to the spot where you're able to connect to the ECUR or ECUC's hotspot. Um, you'll see it on your available Wi-Fi connections. Uh, so you, all of them are going to uh, more or less show that uh, connection name as say ECUR 216000, kind of a long number. Um, so it'll be pretty obvious which one it is there. Um, so you just want to find that one, go ahead and click on it. And then it will ask you for a password. The password is going to be the same for um, all of the ECURs, <clears throat> and it's going to be the number eight, eight times. So literally just pressing the number eight, eight times when it asks for the password, uh, that will allow you to get connected to that ECUR hotspot. Um, and then it should check a, like a check mark afterwards, just showing you that you're connected on there. And so then after you get connected uh, to the ECU hotspot, um, you're going to want to go ahead and pull back up the EMA Manager app. And once you do that, you'll get a page that looks like this. And how you know if you got connected correctly is if that current power circle, or that circle that says current power right in the middle, um, that's how you know uh, that you got to the right spot. And then right below that, you'll see that ECU number on that picture with a green dot next to it. That lets you know that you are connected to that ECU hot, ECUR hotspot, um, and you are good to go. Uh, basically able to do what you need to do at this point to get your system commissioned.
And so after you're on this page, just as this arrow is showing, it, showing on there, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and click that workspace icon down there at the bottom. And that's going to pull up quite a few options here. Um, the one that we're looking to show on this particular slide is getting the ECU internet connection going. Um, and this could be used either for the straight connect with an ethernet cord directly to the router, or if you're gonna set it up on Wi-Fi, uh, this would be the spot that you're gonna wanna go to. Uh, it's kind of highlighted there in a box, um, shows ECU network settings is the icon that we're gonna want. And so after you click that ECU network settings icon, it's gonna give you two options here. Um, it's going to have a WLAN settings and a LAN settings. If you were using the ethernet cord directly from the ECU to the router, uh, the LAN settings is where you're gonna wanna go. Um, after you make the connection, you can go here and you're gonna wanna ensure that the IP address that is coming out or that is the ECU is connected to uh, the router, it'll give you an IP address and you just wanna make sure that it does not end in 0.131.228. If you do get that IP address, it basically means that there's a firewall present between the router and the ECU, and it will need to be bypassed. Um, if you do come into that situation, we do have some literature on it, but you could also give us a shout to on our customer service number, and we can walk you through how to do that. Um, most of the time, what we'll wanna have you do is just switch the connection from ethernet to Wi-Fi, and it should bypass, but yeah, if you come into that issue, I would suggest just to give us a shout. Um, but what you should see here after clicking on that LAN settings is hopefully an IP address that is anything other than ending in 0.228. And figure if it's not ending in 0.228, you're in business and that ECU is connected to the router. The second part of this equation would be if you wanted to set it up via Wi-Fi. So after you set or click on the ECU network settings icon like we did a couple slides ago, um, and this screen shows up, and let's say you're going to connect this ECUR to Wi-Fi, you just want to want to click that WLAN or WLAN section instead of the LAN section. Once you click that WLAN section over to the right on this pictures on this page, it's going to give you the available options that are around your area. And so what you're going to want to look for is look for the customer's network. Go ahead and click on it. It will ask you for a password, and that password will be the one that the customer set up um, for themselves for that router. So you will have to ask them for the password, but figure go ahead and click on their network, enter their password, and that'll get it set up uh, for you on the internet via Wi-Fi. And how do I know if the ECU accepted, let's just say, for example, you set it up on Wi-Fi, how do I know if the ECU accepted and is now connected to the internet via Wi-Fi? After you go through that ECU network settings configuration, you're gonna to wanna to go back to the home page. You can kind of see that picture on the left with that arrow down at the bottom pointing to that home icon there. That's where you're gonna to wanna to go. Um, and after you click on it, it'll look like this. And what you're looking for is to have the ECU number with the green dot next to it, and then also internet connected with the green dot there as well. That'll let you know that you are connected to the internet and you should be good to go at that point. Um, and then kind of moving on from the internet side of things. Um, would you go mind go back just one slide on that? Perfect. Um, yeah, it's talking about doing the inverter connection progress uh, to check communication with the ECU. I might actually skip that for now. I think we have a slide coming up here showing how to enter the IDs and I'll probably go over that um, when we come on. And this is just also a quick slide talking about uh, the ECU C. Um, you will see some indicator lights down there on the bottom of the ECUC. And we just wanted to point out what those lights mean. Um, you're going to have a ECU, uh, call it a, a power button, that should light up green when you do plug in the power source for the ECU. Um, and then you're also going to have a section there that will light up green when it's sending data to the EMA. Uh, that'll let you know that the connection between the microinverters, the ECU, and our server is basically valid and that it's sending data back and forth. And that'll let you know that your ECU is connected to the internet and the EMA monitoring. So you should be basically good to go if you have both of those lights showing up as green for you. And then um, we're going to go into some of the ECU configuration, kind of like what I was just talking about with entering the IDs and then also a couple different options to do here. 
Um, so let's say you've got your uh, internet connected and you want to go to configure um, the ECU in the site a little bit more. You just want to go ahead and click that workspace icon down there at the bottom. And then after you click on that work uh, space uh, icon down there at the bottom, you'll see the different options here on that left far left picture. Uh, the one that we were going to go over now was regarding the ID management. And so this is where you're going to want to go to enter the microinverter IDs so that you can sync it up with the ECU and the ECU can send that data to our servers, which would basically allow you to uh, see what's going on with the system from anywhere. And so you just gonna wanna click on that ID management icon. And after you click on that ID management icon, it's going to look like that middle picture here. And so you just gonna wanna click that add button in the bottom left corner. And after clicking that add button, the picture on the far right is gonna give you a couple different options for how to add those IDs onto the ECU. Um, it's going to allow you to either scan uh, the barcodes, which would basically mean that it's gonna connect with your smartphone camera. And you're able to use your camera from your phone and literally just scan them over the barcodes that you would pull off of the microinverter. And that'll automatically upload it here to this ID management page. And you would just go one by one scan your first microinverter, scan your second microinverter, scan your third microinverter, and just on down the list. And so figure you can do it that way. And we prefer that way, just because it eliminates any potential typos that you can do by doing it the manual way, which we will go over here in a second. But if at all possible, highly recommend to use the scan option because that will eliminate typos and it seems to go a lot quicker that way as well. Uh, so figure that's option one for entering the inverter IDs is to use the scan function. And this is actually a really good picture here, shows you what it actually looks like when you press that scan button. And so this kind of top right picture, that's basically what it looks like when you have um, the EMA manager app connected with your smartphone camera, just go through and scan those. And then it'll show up just like it does on that bottom uh, right corner picture there. And then you can confirm that it comes through. Um, I've used this numerous times. I always recommend to go this route. It goes quicker, eliminates typos. It's on the bottom left. Um, when you're able to, to place those, uh, each of those uh, kind of serial number labels, there, there's two of them. And so uh, we designed that specifically so that you're able to peel one off of each microinverter uh, to create your uh, your display map uh, so that you know the positions of each of those micros so that when you create that that total uh, uh, map on like you see on the bottom left you can just run that that scan using the rapid scan feature uh, right down the list and it only takes a matter of seconds so you can do um, yeah large a large volume of those uh, those scans very rapidly so just a, a little helpful tip there to, to uh, help uh, expedite this process. Yeah, and good, good call out, Jason. Um, a lot of installers will do it that way. <clears throat> they'll make a inverter map and they'll have all the IDs just listed on one piece of paper. Um, I've done them before myself while in the field. And if you do have a map like that when you're scanning, <clears throat> you could probably get through it in less than about a minute or two. Um, it's, it's literally that fast. Um, just on down the list like Jason's talking about. Uh, so it's super convenient. Um, yeah, good call to mention that. Um, and then after you are done entering your IDs, whether it be done through the scanning function or through the manual input function, there is one step that you absolutely have to do. Um, and that is press that sync button down there at the bottom left corner. That is going to initiate the ECU to go out and find the IDs that you just entered and pull communication back in so that it can upload it to that EMA portal or our servers, so to say. If you do not press that sync button, the ECU will not go out and find those numbers and pull communication back. And you'll have a site that looks like it's just not doing anything at all. Um, a bunch of not communicating microinverters is what you would see. Uh, so just wanna call out that if you have any techs or installers that are doing this while on site or even yourself, but just make sure after you enter the IDs to press that sync button. Otherwise, communication will not start for your site.
Um, and then, yep, after you uh, go ahead and enter those IDs and press that sync button, uh, you're going to get that message there on the left-hand picture. It's going to say replace UIDs in ECU with these IDs. Um, you're just going to want to head and click OK. Um, and then you're going to want to check the ID registration in the ECU if it's successful or not. Um, the way in which you'll know if it is synced up um, is going to have a green dot on the left of the number and then also going to say OK. Um, under the sync status column there. Um, if you get both of those to show up, figure that microinverter number is synced up with the ECU and should be communicating back with the portal, so to say. Um, and then a couple other things like we were talking about when we get into this is configuring the ECU. Um, some things that we see pretty frequently get missed is gonna be the ECU date settings. Um, often what'll happen is the ECU will default to Pacific Standard Time um, so if you're installing on the East Coast or say in the Midwest or whatever the case may be, um, highly recommend to go in and set the uh, time zone for it. Um, otherwise, you might have a customer that's looking at it and thinking, you know, hey, why is my, uh, you know, why is it saying that it's 6 a.m. and I'm, I'm getting this production coming through when in reality it's 9 a.m. Um, so just make sure to go through and change the ECU debt date settings. Super easy, just a couple quick clicks. It'll save some hassle down the road. Um, but then also, too, you're going to want to set the correct parameters for the microinverters that you're installing, uh, whether it be, say, QT2, DS3, uh, whatever the case may be. If you're working on a three-phase, you know, 208 volt system, or maybe it's a normal residential 240, um, whatever the case may be, you're going to want to go through, select the grid profile button, and find the corresponding one that you're going to want to use for your site. Um, that will set the correct parameters for the microinverters to work under those conditions. Um, if it is set incorrectly, it can cause um, things to not work correctly. You might have to go back and we have to change things for you. But um, if you have any questions about that, you can always feel free to give us a shout. But it's pretty straightforward. Just want to make sure that you guys select the right grid profile so that the microinverters can work correctly. Um, and then going into some of the uh, system configuration with regards to um, production, uh, let's say, for example, you get all your IDs entered and you wanna check and see, you know, are they producing, are they communicating, you know, what's going on with them. Um, after you do all of that, you're gonna have some options down there um, at the bottom icons. You're gonna to wanna to either click on module or click on data. Uh, that will allow you to check out individual microinverters and see if they're working properly or not. Um, so we just wanted to point out on this page where you go to check that. And um, then I believe the next one is gonna show what it looks like after you do um, click the module or data page. No, it does not. Um, sorry about that. It's more or less just a way, and I just kind of wanted to point it out real quick. Um, so if you do have tax that are commissioning on site, they can click that module or data button, and it will allow them to check out individual voltages, current, temperature, um, quite a few different readings with regards to each individual microinverter. Uh, so it's a good tool to use to know if your installers can basically leave site knowing that everything is working. And yeah, on this page, uh, kind of like what I was talking about, it's a one-stop workplace for installers while using the EMA Manager app. Um, you can use it as a local commissioning tool. You can use it as a customer navigator, um, figure maintenance anytime, anywhere, an admin workspace, operations management. Um, Kind of like I was mentioning, once you do uh, log in to your EMA manager app, say using an installer credential login, it's going to allow you access to see every one of your customers that you have installed and had an account created for. You can go and check individual production for that particular customer. You can see if something is working, not working, maybe why it's not working, you know, all of those things while you're on the go. Um, and so it's, it's more or less a one-stop shop app. Um, and I highly recommend for everybody to use it. Um, a lot of times you can find things in there that will eliminate you, say, even having to call us to know what's going on with the system. Uh, we try to train people when they do call in just to how to use the app as best as possible. Um, but figure there's just a lot of information on there that you can get. And lastly, uh, we're gonna wanna do an EMA portal walkthrough. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And let's just make sure I got this pulled up. Oh, 
the mic. There we go. Do you want to allow me to uh, share the screen, Jason? I think it's giving me an error message. There we go. Okay. And is that coming through for you guys? All right, perfect. Um, so we wanted to go over a couple of different things, uh, just doing this EMA portal live walkthrough. Uh, one of the first ones that I wanted to go over was talking about how to register a customer. Um, if you are going to be creating customer accounts um, on the desktop version of our portal, um, this is what it would look like. I'm sure some of you on the call have probably seen this before. Uh, but just wanted to briefly go over it, show you a couple pointers here real quick. Um, and if you haven't registered a customer on our desktop version of the EMA, uh, this is what it would look like. Figure up here, you're going to want to click on registration to get to this spot, and it'll ask you to add customer. And then once you click that add customer button, uh, this is the page that'll come up for you. And figure any customer that you're going to be registering on here on the desktop version. Um, is going to have a five-step process. Yep. Step one being personal info, step two, ECU info, step three, inverter info, and on down the line. Um, this first one here is going to be where you're going to want to enter the customer's personal information. And so this top section is going to have username, password, first name, last name. And so you actually create the username that the customer is going to want to use to check their production on the app or on the desktop version. So up here, you would just go through, make the username, whatever you would want it to be. Um, with this one, I just did test webinar 12. Um, and then you're gonna wanna enter the password that you're gonna wanna make for the customer as well. Um, so you make the username, make the password, enter some of their information here, first name, last name. And then this part, I wanted to point out briefly because after you're done creating this account fully, when you go through all five steps, um, they're going to get an email letting them know it's kind of like a welcome email, you know, your username, your password is this, uh, here are some helpful tips, you know, a um, little bit of stuff on there, but whatever email you enter in this spot here is where that welcome email is going to go to. So you don't want to enter yours or say like a company email here, you're going to want to make sure that you got the customer's email listed correctly here. Also too, <clears throat> if they ever forget their password, um, they're going to want to make sure that this is correct because if they click that forgot password link when they're trying to reset their password, this is where that research link, reset link is gonna go to. Uh, so just make sure that you got the correct customer email listed here. It could save you some phone calls down the road. Um, and then also pretty self-explanatory with the rest of this page, you're just gonna wanna enter the customer's you know, address, city, state, zip code. And then also on this side over here, um, you're gonna wanna input the system size. So say 5.8 kW, um, and then the module type is going to be the actual manufacturer and model number of the modules. Um, that's what we request to go for in this spot. Um, so just something like QP Duo Black Q10, you know, that would suffice this particular situation. And then right below that, you're going to want to do the STC rating of the modules that you're installing. So if you have a 400 watt module, you just put 400 there. In this instance, I just put 395. Um, but whatever rated module or wattage module you have, just go ahead and put it in that spot. And then the grid type, kind of like what we were talking about through the app setting the grid profile. Um, this section here is going to show you a couple different options. So depending on what you have going on, uh, just make sure that you select the correct grid profile. And then once you're done doing that, we're going to go on to step two. So it'll go for me. And so in this section, all you're doing, it's called the ECU info. All you're doing is just entering that ECU number um, that you have at this particular site. And so normally speaking, you would just go ahead and click that add button at the top right corner, enter your ECU ID here. And you could also name it if you would like. A lot of times people will skip this section and it's not necessarily critical, but let's say for example, you have two ECUs on site, one on the house, one on the barn. I would go ahead and name it in that situation saying, you know, this is the house ECU, this is the barn ECU, it'll just help you uh, say differentiate, maybe if there's two ECUs on site or something like that, uh, but figure not necessarily required to name it, but 
you definitely can if you would like to. And I already entered one here. So this is what it'll look like um, after you're done entering that ECU number. And that's all you do for this is yeah, literally just enter that ECU number and go on to the next step. And so this is the one where a lot of people will get confused um, on how to do this particular part. And so this step is called the inverter info section. And so this is where you're gonna to want to enter all of the inverter IDs that are on that particular site. Um, and so you have a couple options to do so, but you're just gonna to wanna to start by clicking this add button in the top right corner. And this is where you have a couple options. So if you're a technician or you um, happen to scan all of the microinverter IDs while connected locally there on site, kind of like what we were talking about just a little bit ago, um, if you come and make this customer page and they did get scanned in and synced up with the ECU, you're just literally gonna press this button here, insert UID to temporary list, and all of the IDs will show up here on the right side. And I wasn't able to do it for this particular example, so I know it's maybe not the best viewpoint, but um, if you did scan them and get them synced up, just press that insert UID to temporary list button and all of those IDs will show up here on the right side. You also have the option too, if they didn't get scanned in while on site, and let's just say like the tech or the installer happened to just give you, you know, the sticker map or the, the UID map after they were done, but didn't really do anything with it. Um, you could say scan it there while you're at the office, or you could just manually enter it here as well. So instead of doing import from ECU, you're just going to want to do manual add. Um, and then you're going to want to make sure that the correct ECU is showing up here. And then you're going to want to find the type of product that you installed. So let's just say, for example, for this one, we're doing DS3. And then it'll have this option down here below for the channel. And so you have a couple different options for it. As you probably are well aware, um, our DS3 microinverters have two modules that connect to one microinverter. And so when you see that channel and it says com one comma two, that's gonna let you know that you're entering two modules for the number that you're entering. Or if you have one microinverter with only one module plugged into it, you can just select a single channel rather than both. And so let's go through and just add one on here. And after you add your, your number onto there, you're just gonna to wanna to click this insert UID to temporary list. And just a quick note, if you did have multiple that you needed to do, you can do them all in the same box, just one after another. And so you don't necessarily have to do one by one. You can do you know, three at a time, four at a time, whatever the case may be. And then after you're done doing that, you just click that insert UID to temporary list. And then they all show up there on that right-hand side. And that's just gonna let you know that those have been entered into the ECU and those are the corresponding numbers and kind of like what you were talking about with the channel. Um, after entering this number here, you have channel one and channel two, just for this specific microinverter. So that would be two modules for that one microinverter and same things for these ones down below. And then after you're done entering all your IDs, just go ahead and press that submit button right there on the bottom right. And before you go on to step four, this is the critical part that we were just speaking about a little while ago on the app, um, talking about syncing up the microinverters to start communication. If you were to create this on uh, the desktop version, the same exact thing can be done here, but instead of it saying sync, it's link. Make sure to press that link button before you go on to step four. That'll make the ECU go out, find these numbers, pull communication back in. Even if your guys say sync them up on site, I would probably press this again before you go on to step four, just in case. Um, so whenever you're entering this ID section under the step three, when you're creating an account, before you go on to step four, make sure to press that link button, hit send, you'll be good to go. And so moving on to the group view info, which is step four here, this is gonna be the spot where you go and make that module by module view for the customer. Uh, what they would view on their app. And so it's similar to step three when we entered the inverter IDs, You're just gonna wanna click this add button up here in the top right corner. It's gonna tell you which ECU number you're doing it for and the view name, you can make it whatever you would want. Um, let's say for example, you have you know panels on the south facing back corner of the home or something like that. You can just put like say south roof or if you have like say multiple groupings of panels, you can make individual 
you know, viewpoints for each of those groupings. But for this instance, I'm just going to call it array. And I typically like to do one and one here. But uh, let's say, for example, you had five, you know, five rows of five panels each. You can make it to where um, you put five and five, and that will allow our system to make. And you'll see here in just a second what that looks like. But to be honest, I typically like to do one and one and then just add modules as I go when I make these. Let's go ahead and do that. Hit the create button. And then this is what it will look like. You have all those numbers that you entered here on the left hand side. And then this section over here on the right is going to be where you want to make the, what it looks like on the roof, so to say. So all you're going to want to do is just take those numbers, drag them over to the right and start making your layout. And so let's say in this instance, you just have a grouping of six modules. Just go through, add your six over to the right, and that's all you have to do. And I will say that there is quite a few different options that you can do with the modules just by right-clicking on your mouse. So let's just right-click on that individual module. It's gonna give you some options like importing UID, deleting the UID, changing the orientation. So if you had like say portrait or landscape, you would just click that there and that'll make it flip. You also can change the module type, delete it all together, add a row above, add a column above, quite a few different things you can do just by right clicking on it. Uh, so if you weren't aware of that uh, figure, you can change quite a few things just by right clicking. And so let's just say you get all of your setup done. The one step you're gonna wanna do before you go ahead and go to step five, just make sure that you hit this save button in the top right corner. That is going to save whatever progress you have made here. And that'll be the viewpoint for the customer going forward. So I'll go ahead and hit that save button. Uh-oh. It's like I didn't like it when I pressed it. Let's go back one. Okay, so actually, yep. So it looks like it saved it there. And once you're done and hit that save button, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and go on to step five, just by hitting that next button down there in the bottom right corner. Um, and so this section here, this is gonna be where you're gonna to wanna to upload quite a few different things from the site. Uh, we would be asking for breaker photos, pictures of how the modules look on the roof, um, any pertinent information that would be helpful to us if we ever needed to look into the site remotely. Um, we highly recommend to upload as much drawing pictures as you can. Uh, one of the ones that we typically request if it's not there is going to be the UID sticker map. Uh, so like the map that we were talking about a little while ago where the stickers get peeled off and get put onto a piece of paper or even like a piece of cardboard. Um, I would take a picture of that and upload it in this section just in case we ever need to troubleshoot any microinverters down the road. Um, basically any pertinent information would want to get uploaded to this particular site figure. The more information we have, the better. And let's just say, uh, for example, you get all of those pictures uploaded, you know, you're good to go. That is the last step on this. You go ahead and hit that complete registration button. And really quickly, uh, just to add that that whole uh, uploading of the, the pictures, it, it can also be used as an opportunity by by installers for record keeping for a particular site. So if you if you keep a file on each of those installations, uh, say it's a hard copy or something that you have uh, uh, digital files of, uh, it's great to have because this is all hosted in the cloud. So it's great to have that as kind of a, a permanent history of of what happened with that that site, what it looks like for your text uh, to be able to pull up and 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 look and troubleshoot in case there was anything at the the site yep. you had any questions so yep and good good call out there um, and i know we're running up against uh running up against time now so i'll be brief with this this last little section um if you do install our products um and ever have any questions i just wanted to point this out that if you were to log into uh, the ema portal on like i say a desktop computer and um, you're going to have this option up here in the top the top icon section that says setting um if you click on that setting button uh, you're going to want to go to resource and then under this resource section, you're gonna have a lot of literature that can help you out with quite a few different situations. Um, the one that I like to point out the most is this AP Systems Troubleshooting Guide. Um, if you were to go through, like I said, click on that setting button, go to resource, AP Systems Troubleshooting Guide. 
this is what it would look like. And as you can just tell by the table of contents, it gives you quite a bit of information. If you ever have any communication issues with the microinverter, it'll define them and also tell you how to fix them. Uh, if you have any production issues with the microinverter, it'll define them and tell you how to fix them. Any communications thing, same thing, uh, define them and tell you how to fix them. Um, there's a lot of information on here, things that you might call us about or things that say, we maybe even gave you a, a description of what the issue is, but you weren't quite understanding what we told you. Um, this piece here can give you a lot of that information. And it kind of just goes through and tells you exactly how our microinverters work, how to fix them if there's ever problems, you know, whatever the case may be, but it's a super valuable resource. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the share. I know we're kind of running up against time right now. Thanks, Derek. Um, I'm going to actually take that, that back so we can uh, conclude the, the webinar here. Um, so one thing I do want to point out, and, and Derek did a, a, a great walkthrough um, on, on what you would see on, on your end. Uh, some of the screens that we also have in that, that EMA portal, like when you first log in, your, your fleet view and being able to see each of your customer accounts. There's a really handy uh, kind of stoplight system here, system status so you can see at a glance if everything's running smoothly, if there may be a yellow light, it, it could be a communication issue, it could be um, just uh, some things you wanna look into. Uh, a red light means uh, there's something uh, you know critical at the side, whether it's, uh, it's you know, not producing energy or uh, it's not communicating at all. Et cetera, so you can uh, just at, quickly at a glance see if there are any issues with uh, any of your your customer accounts, and uh, and this is what you would see uh, in in drilling down to a particular system. Um, and it's very similar to what the customer sees on their side, um, and being able to look at uh, at history, especially if you go into uh, uh, what what we just saw was the, the fleet view and your dashboard, but um, uh, we'll also be able to, to look at reports, look at the history, but I wanted to also show you this module level view. So once you finish the configuration map uh, that uh, that Derek walked you through, um, uh, changing the orientation, changing the positioning, uh, this is what you would see uh, and what the customer would see uh, in terms of module level data. Uh, you also have the option as the solar installer to uh, to not have module level data shown to uh, to your customers. Uh, what some installers like to do is uh, is just not have that feature and then uh, do it by request. Um, it's totally up to you whether or not uh, seeing the individual module level data that uh, causes uh, you more end user headaches uh, than it does uh, you know answer questions. Uh, we we give you that power. So. Um, any of our installers that choose to do so, if, if uh, we have an end user that comes to us, we will send them your way uh, for, for turning that on. That choice is up to you. Uh, or you can have all of your end users uh, just automatically receive the, uh, the module level view. And then some of the details on each of the inverters so that you can see uh, power and voltage, uh, DC. So it's, it's pretty nice to be able to see all of the uh, uh, the, 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 the data, uh, the stats for each of those um, uh, individual inverters, um, and the, the conversion from each of those PV modules. Uh, this is a great troubleshooting tool. Um, and using that guide that Derek showed you uh, that's available here in the EMA and on our website, you'd be able to, uh, to use that to, to diagnose before you even roll a truck. Is it a, is it a bad panel? Is it a something going on with the inverter? Is it communication? Is it a uh, disconnected cable, et cetera? Yep, and there's uh, also too on that uh, previous slide, there's a nifty tool <clears throat> called the compare tool. You'll see it right above the graph there. Um, if you ever wanted to, let's say for example, you had one module on a microinverter working, but the other one on that same microinverter not working, um, you can click that compare button above the graph there and it will allow you to check uh, one module over another. Um, and so let's say, you know, one had, you know, 20 volts on the DC side, the other one had 40, you would basically see that difference shown in the graph. Uh, so if you're ever questioning, you know, that sort of thing and wanted to compare one module to another, uh, just click that compare button that's right above that graph there. And then of course your, your grid profile, there's lots of, um, 
additional uh, settings within that um, that um, are are uh, some of them are adjustable. Some of them are ones that we recommend that you uh, uh, you uh, don't modify. But if you ever ever have any questions um, on any of this, uh, you just uh, just call a member of our team, and um, and we can we can walk you through it. All right, some additional resources. We have um, uh, that support page that I mentioned yesterday uh, to be able to, to contact our team directly. Again, that goes into a pooled uh, email inbox uh, that's addressed by our team. Um, so if you have any questions, you can use that. Um, and we also have a, uh, our training page on our website um, where you can, uh, you can view webinars like these uh, and additional uh, installation tools and materials. Uh, your next step uh, after this webinar, if you are not already set up as an AP Systems installer, is to visit our registration page and fill out that form to request your, your AP Systems installer account. And our team will set you up, we'll create your account, we'll send you the, the link and the login credentials uh, to be able to get in and, and do all these things that Derek showed you. Um, so that's, that's the, your next critical step uh, to moving forward with being an AP Systems installer. Also, the production, uh, the product documentation library that we have on the website has all of the, the data sheets, uh, the manuals. Uh, this training is not a replacement for, for our installation manuals. Uh, we highly recommend you walk through those uh, and make sure that uh, you read those and follow them uh, for, for doing your next installation. Also, our certifications on our products are all on that website too, uh, if you need those for, uh, for uh, uh, commissioning the system. There's also lots of lots of additional information on our YouTube channel. Um, so not just uh, resources that we put together, but uh, that some of our partners have put together as well. I uh, highly encourage you to check those out. If you need to reach us, there was that uh, support page uh, form. You can also use this phone number to, to call us uh, or either of the emails, whether you're based in the US or Canada. Uh, we also have a similar uh, uh, email for Latin America, so support.latam at apsystems.com that would reach our, our LATAM team. Yeah, and figure two, I wasn't sure if the, uh, the hours were mentioned there, but uh, figure we are open on that phone line uh, Monday through Friday, and it's going to be, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but I believe 5, sorry, 8 a.m. Eastern to 8 p.m. Eastern. That's correct. Perfect. All right. Well, that concludes our, our presentation for this morning. Um, we can address your, your questions if uh, you want to, to send those in either through the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, and uh, one of the questions that I'm seeing, Derek, is uh, can the ECUR be used in a commercial installation? So the answer is yes. Um, it can be used in a commercial installation. Figure the only difference between, say, using the ECUC and the ECUR is just going to be some of that extra data that you can get from the ECUC, like the consumption level monitoring, um, or say, know what's going on with some of the loads inside of the house. Um, but you can use an ECUR to pair up with a QT2 or a DS3. Um, it's just the ECUC is going to allow you to get some more of those features uh, that some consumers are looking for, um, but yeah, you definitely can. Awesome, thank you.